Hello, everybody. Thanks yeah. for coming to hang with us on your Monday night. How are you doing? I'm good. You've this been on is, the tour. This is city five of 11. Wow. I was in Minneapolis this morning, Phoenix yesterday. Wow. New York the day before and Atlanta the day before. And tomorrow's San Diego, I think. Maybe. <laughs> we'll look at the calendar later. I was um, just telling uh, Sophia on uh, Thursday, I flew to Atlanta and I took my four-year-old with me just for the day. First kind of trip together. And I put him in, in, in a big audience, like 7,000 people, and I'm like, watch daddy. And it was great. Yeah. It was really cool. That's pretty rad. I don't even think he watched me. I think he was like running around, <laughs> playing with confetti, you know, from the previous and activity. The lights and that all was really cool, like that. to just travel with my little guy for the yeah. first time. So It's so special, man. I mean, what a weird thing. We've known each other almost 10 years. Charity As you Water. said, when Charity Water was a baby. Charity Water was a baby. I mean, we were babies. You didn't have babies yet, and now <laughs> he didn't. has two babies. Um, I did have gray hair, though. Well, listen, <laughs> you, 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 you've had a good life. I feel like that's a, that's a sign. Do you remember when we actually met? Because I realized in preparing for this that I do not. No, I don't. I was just that, feel like you've always been. I'm never uh, You've always been my friend. Yeah. I'm, so I don't remember when we actually We did go met to Ethiopia together, which yeah. was pretty cool. It was pretty rad. Um, we camped in Ethiopia, which was also pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. There were a bunch of people who went on this incredible well trip uh, that Scott organized. And I don't think everybody knew what they were in for, but we spent a week on unpaved roads, bouncing around in, in these trucks yeah. and camping and dancing and singing with the most incredible people. And, and we got to watch... Uh, some of what you guys have probably seen online, these moments where yep. the wells get drilled and water starts shooting out of the ground and, and entire communities mm. realize that their lives and their children's lives are changed forever. I and that never gets old. Yeah. No. And you said there's how many wells in the region we were in now? I think there's 10,000 now. Wow. Casual. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> okay. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna roll us back a little bit just because. I obviously know your story, but everybody here may not know your story. Um, so you have had one of, and we were just talking about this backstage, one of the most, I would say, dramatic <laughs> career 180s of anybody I know and probably of any, anybody you guys know. Um, you went from being, I would say, New York's best professional partier to being one of the most trusted and admired experts in the nonprofit field. And can you talk to us about how that happens? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I mean, in, in a way, the, the decade in nightlife was a betrayal of, you know, act one of my mm -hmm. life, which was, you know, I was brought up um, helping to take care of a mom who was really sick. There was this accident in our house, carbon monoxide gas leak when I was four, and mm -hmm. my parents were just this good Christian family that went to church on Sundays. They didn't sue the gas company for negligence. You know, they were just these really good people that raised me with, with good values and to be a moral kid. And, you know, in, in some ways, um, you know, I live out the prodigal son parable. At like 18, I'm mm -hmm. like, screw everybody, you know, flip <laughs> the bird to my parents, flip the bird to the church, and I'm going to move to New York City and explore the opposite of that um, maybe, you know, rules-based kind of religious life. And, you know, when I, when I moved to New York, you know, I, I don't know, I thought, well, if you're going to rebel, you should do it in style. Right. And you did I like just, the decade-long Rome Springer, basically. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just, I couldn't believe that you could get paid to professionally drink. Right. That this was actually a job. And the, the better you get, like the, the better you get at becoming a club promoter, brands actually pay you to drink their brand in public. Like there was a time when mm. um, Bacardi and Budweiser were paying our rent. Like it was four G's a month just to be seen, you know, with Budweiser beer on our table in our clubs. Oh. And, you know, for a while that felt great, right? You're like, you know, spraying champagne from the DJ booth over a thousand people who all paid to get in and, you know, we're spending 20 bucks on a vodka soda. And, um, and then over time, you know, it just starts to take its toll mm. on on your soul, really. And, you know, I picked up all the vices that would come with the territory slowly, you know, smoking first and then drinking and then, oh, let me try, you know, 
drug one, drug two, drug seven, drug 14. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we should all go gambling. You know, I turned into a gambling degenerate. Um, you know, we should go to a couple strip clubs, which leads to pornography, which leads to just this kind of, mm. you know, this, this darkness. Um, and I had this, this point in time where my life looked so good on the outside, you know, and, and I was going to dinner at the hottest restaurant at 10 and the club at 12. And, um, but then I was going to sleep at noon, right. which is not healthy. Right. <laughs> you know, well, I wasn't. It's, it's the personification of the highlight reel that is Instagram, but it was exactly. pre Instagram. Exactly, and it was. I remember this this moment I write about in the book. Um, I remember exactly where I was. On, I was on Houston Street, um, and it was noon, and I was taking Ambien to come down, and I'd been up all night. I remember mm. looking out the window at my friend's place, and people on their lunch break. Like that was how life was supposed to be lived. Mm. You know, I was taking the comforter cover, and I was trying to to actually blot out all the light, <clears throat> so that I could get some sleep to then wake up at seven or eight p.m. and then do it all over again. Mm. So. Thankfully, you know, I had this um, realization that my life was terrible and I had become the worst person almost, um, you know, slowly and then suddenly almost like the, you know, the frog realizes, oh my gosh, I am actually going to boil to death. Well, mm. I guess the frog in the story doesn't realize it, but <laughs> I, I realized that. I was lucky to realize that. And then, um, you know, through a, a series of circumstances, asked myself, what would the opposite of my life look like? And I think I was much more interested in the extreme change mm -hmm. than the pivot, you know, than the, like, it was, it was so bad, I needed to try 180 degrees. Mm. And, you know, the only thing I could think of was quit all the stuff that I was doing, start over, and, and dedicate a year of my life in service to others instead of um, more hedonistic, you know, service or, you know, more pursuit of degeneracy, I guess. Mm. And that led me to you know, this, this amazing opportunity in Liberia on a hospital ship with these unbelievable doctors and surgeons. And um, I was just doing a podcast recently and someone said, you know, so you quit all this stuff, you quit drugs and smoking and you never did any of that again. So many people are struggling with addiction. What do you think was different for you? And I think, um, I, I'd never even thought about it until this week, until being asked that question, but my environment changed so radically. I mean, I went from being surrounded with people who did drugs for a living and partied for a living. I mean, I was inviting them into that lifestyle. Mm. And then I'm now in Africa mm. on a ship with the most respected doctors and surgeons who have given up their vacation time. You know, they could have been in the Maldives. They were rich. And they decided, you know, they're going to do a month in Liberia. So it was, I was overwhelmed by the, the selflessness, the purity of this community. Mm. It's almost like I didn't, I didn't want to do any of that stuff anymore right well there's that adage that if you can't see it you can't be it and I think that what can be mm. so hard for people when they're struggling with addiction or, or whatever a, a big vice is is that they're trying to change their behavior yeah. but they're still living their routine in the same job in the same house in the same relationships so you're trying to make a massive shift but you actually it's like you got picked up you know, by a bird yeah. and dropped somewhere else completely. And so you got to see everything that you weren't seeing in, yep. in the other spot. And I wanted it. I mean, it was yeah. way better. Yeah. It was way better. Well, you got purpose out of it too. Yeah. It's so cool. So <clears throat> I made notes. I just mm. really get excited about preparing for things like this. I like the binder. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I was really pumped. Um, I, you... What you're talking about is mercy ships, mm -hmm. and, and it's very cool. In some of the charity water videos, you can see the kinds of surgeries that yeah. you're talking about and, and the way that in, in cultures where you know, mass tumors or deformities can often be seen as a curse and, yeah. and people who suffer from them are exiled, you really change people's lives with yeah. an organization like that. So where did the shift happen when it went from sort of that type of medical attention to mm -hmm. water? Well, there are a couple of pieces to it. So the first was, <clears throat> I'd say the formative experience on Mercy Ships happened on day three when uh, it was the patient screening. It was the triage day. Mm. And the advance team had put up these posters all over the country saying, a ship is coming, doctors are coming. Mm. If you're sick, come to the city and stand in the parking lot outside the soccer or the football arena you know, this huge, huge arena. And, 
you know, I knew that we had 1,500 available surgery slots to fill. And I remember thinking, like, is it possible there's 1,500 severely deformed people? I mean, I'd never seen any of this stuff in my life. <clears throat> and my third day there, it was five in the morning, and I remember grabbing two Nikon cameras and putting on hospital scrubs and jumping in this convoy of Land Rovers. It was still dark. And, you know, we wind through the city, and then we turn the corner, and there's 5,000 people standing outside the stadium. And it just hit me in that moment, like, we're going to send 3,000 plus people home yeah. without seeing a doctor, without being able to treat them. And I later learned, you know, later that day, that some of these people had walked for more than a month. Uh -huh. And some of them were walking with their children. They'd actually walked from Sierra Leone, from Guinea, from neighboring countries, crossing borders, because yeah. they heard the doctors were coming. So that was kind of one piece, was that we are in over our heads don't have enough doctors, don't have enough resources, the ship isn't big enough um, to meet the need. And then as I got into the villages, I saw that people were drinking disgusting water. I saw they were drinking from green algae-filled swamps, from ponds, from rivers. I, I mean, I, I'd never seen dirty water before. Mm. You know, I sold, I sold Voss, guys, like for 10 bucks <laughs> in tall bottles, was, you know, sparkling or still. And, and people, you know, people in our clubs, I remember, they would order water, they wouldn't even drink it. Just as a sign of status, they were drinking champagne or, or vodka instead. So there was just something so visceral about, you know, the, I mean, you, you, you know, if you have a book, you can look in the middle. Some of these photos are like, uh, it was just shocking. Mm. The, the tumors and the, the flesh and the, the suffering we were seeing. But then seeing the water was just as shocking because this is water I wouldn't let an animal drink. And I'm watching children drink this. Mm. And it's just all they have. And I learned 50% of the country is drinking bad water. So I just really put these two things together. We don't have enough doctors. More people are turning up sick than we can help. 50% of the country doesn't have the most basic need for health met. Why don't I go work on the bigger problem? Mm -hmm. um, and, and a doctor said that to me. He said, you know, look, you could, whoops. He said, you could go um, raise money for the next $60 million hospital ship, which could do a few thousand surgeries, or you could try to bring clean water to the world and eliminate the need for hospital ships, you know, mm -hmm. or at least in the waterborne. So I kind of stumbled into water. I'd say the other thing that I, that I really discovered was that the same gift for promoting nightclubs could be used to promote redemptive work, let's yeah. say. So what I was really doing for 10 years was telling a story. Like, come to our club, make it past the velvet rope, sit at the right table with the right people, and your life has meaning. Mm. Right? And go home wasted, you know, mm. and maybe hook up. You get to um, feel special. Right? So, so that, but that worked. And I was always trying to keep the DJs, you know, moving in the DJs, and we would throw three theme parties. We were always trying to keep it interesting. So the cool thing is I got to take that club list of 15,000 people to Africa. So imagine being on my club list, and, you know, on Monday, you get invited to the Prada Megastore opening in Soho, New York. And like a couple weeks later, you're getting a picture of a four pound facial tumor. Yeah. Or, you know, hey, I'm, I'm in the leprosy colony, you know. So there were a few unsubscribes. Uh, I'm not going to lie, like, you know, <laughs> wrong list, right? But, but I, I think that was, the, that was the edge case. 99% of the people were writing me back saying, this is amazing. Yeah. How do I help these doctors? How do I pay for a surgery? How do I join the ship like you? I remember a woman wrote once, she said, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here in Chanel and our, our headquarters are brightly lit and I have tears streaming down my face and people think that like my parents died, but I just read one of these stories about a woman who was ostracized and was stoned when people saw her face and had to cover her face and she got a 40 minute surgery and they just gave her her entire face and her life back. Hmm. So I think I learned that A, water was a really, really important thing. If I really cared about health and making any sort of global impact, start there. Start with the most basic need for health. And then two, you know, I could actually redeem the things that I'd learned over those 10 years and some of those same relationships and just tell a different story. Tell a completely different, you know, meaningful, redemptive story. Hmm. I love that. So... One of the things I think is really interesting that a lot of people don't know, and part of the reason that water affects me and my passion so much, is that water really is, at its core, a women's issue. Mm -hmm. And it has a tremendous effect in these communities on women and girls. 
And that's something that I think people would like to understand the complexity yeah. of. Well, I, we, didn't, we didn't know that, at least I didn't know that in the very beginning. Mm. Um, and, you know, it, it hit pretty early on. So I've now, gosh, I've now been to 69 countries and I've been to Ethiopia 30 times. Nowhere I go around the world do I see men get water. Mm. So culturally, whether it's sub-Saharan Africa, whether it's India, whether it's Pakistan or Bangladesh or Central and South America, it just, it's culturally the role of the women and the girls to go get the water. Now, the mm -hmm. men at best are farming and providing an income. Sometimes they're drinking. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, it's, it's not uncommon to see 20 men sitting under a tree in the shade while the women are walking for the firewood, walking for the water. And, you know, this is, the hardship is just, it's so hard to fathom. Um, the challenges for these women, because often the water's far, mm -hmm. it's a river, you know, it's, it's not near where the town is. Um, women will get raped on their way, you know, to these water holes. They'll get attacked by hyenas, they'll get attacked by alligators. I mean, the first kind of, the first few times you hear all this stuff, you're like, that's it's not true. It's hyperbole, right? And you hear it 70 times. You hear about alligator and crocodile attacks, crocodile, sorry. Um, 70 different times and you, you hear the names of women who went to get water and were never seen again, you, know, you realize it's real. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think what's, what surprised me over the years is we'll go into villages and we'll ask the women, now that you have clean water, let's say it's a well or a rainwater system or whatever we built or whatever our local partners built, um, how's your life different now? I was always expecting them to talk about how dirty the water was and how clean it is. Because hmm. it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's brown viscous. It's like chocolate milk. You know, you would see these water sources and say, uh, we'd just be so shocked. I mean, it would be unthinkable for us. But they never talked about that. They always talked about the time that they were now saving, mm -hmm. not having to walk for water, and the things they were doing with that time. And we would hear stories of entrepreneurship, of women selling rice at the market, selling peanuts at the market. Um, I was in Zab Zimbabwe recently. Women were selling rugs for four bucks. And you know, if you think about it, um, imagine having six hours um, just instantly put back in your day, seven mm. days a week. Mm -hmm. So you reclaim 42 hours. Because walking for water, you don't get to take Saturdays and Sundays off. Mm -hmm. This is seven days, 365, it's forever. But you don't get water on a Saturday and Sunday. You don't drink water. There's no cooking for your family. And you know, we would hear just these amazing stories of women's lives transformed. Um, you know, one of my favorites that I, I drive by in the book and I wish I had more time to unpack was this woman named Helen Appio. And we met her in Uganda. And <clears throat> she'd actually been walking a long distance to another well. So she was getting clean water, but it was, she spent her whole days walking and she would bring back two jerry cans, so 10 gallons of water. So her whole day would be spent walking for four toilet flushes in our world. And she brings the water back into her village and she would tell us, she said, look, every day I would have to make decisions on what do I do with not enough water. Do I cook? Do I clean? Do I garden? Do I wash my husband's body? Do I wash my husband's clothes? Do I wash my kids' bodies or their school uniforms? And she said, I'm a Ugandan woman. So we always put our families first. So she said, I never use the water for myself. I always use it for my family. And she said, now there's, clean, there's a well. Um, it was uh, um, a minute and a half from her house. She said, I can take all the water that I want. And she said, now I'm beautiful. And we're a little dense. We're like, Helen, of course, you're a beautiful Ugandan woman. She says, no, I don't think you understand. For the first time in my life, I have enough water to wash my clothes and my face and my body and she said, I feel beautiful. Yeah. And I remember she said, now I'm looking so smart. <laughs> and, you know, we, these stories just really, um, they change the way you think about water. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, until that time we had been talking about the medical health benefits of water, the education impact of water, the, um, the economic data between water. Like, just the simple fact that, that water can restore dignity mm -hmm. to a woman. Um, it was really powerful. So these, you know, this has been kind of oxygen to the organization as we've traveled around and, mm. and seen. Um, we're now starting to measure the time differential. So yeah. we'll go into a village and we're documenting how far all the women are walking and then we're doing the after. And we're, we're quantifying tens of millions of hours saved. Mm -hmm. 
So now it's going from the abstract to the, wow, we, we actually know how much time has been saved. And it's that kind of storytelling that makes these types of problems quantifiable for mm. people. And it makes them feel personal. And I remember one of the villages that we visited uh, when we were in Ethiopia together, and I don't remember what day, but I remember the blue tarp that was up when we pulled mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. And I remember Chris, uh, another friend of ours, telling me that years prior, when you guys first visited that village, he was traumatized because you pulled up and there were children's bodies wrapped in shrouds getting ready mm -hmm. to be buried because people's kids were dying from mm -hmm. waterborne illnesses. And we pull up and there's kids playing soccer. Yeah. Like there's a soccer ball and everybody's running around and having a great time. They and kicked our butts too. Oh yeah. I mean, brutal. I was just like, okay, I see. great. I'm very out of shape. I gotcha. Um, but I realize, I think about how excited I am to go back, knowing how many more wells yeah. there are now, even than a couple of years ago when we went. And I have the joke that I never got to crack because Tell everybody. the, well, the, you know, we understand that water changes things for women mm -hmm. and it also changes things for girls because boys get to go to school while girls mm -hmm. walk with their moms to get water. So now moms like Helen can do something so simple as, as wash their own face, but Helen's daughters get to go to school. But you know, there's still like, a, it's not exact gender parity. No. And, uh, and, and the, the fascination of all these guys sitting around in this village, just like, why aren't you married? You mean you don't have a husband? <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't want a husband. And, you know, they're like, but we don't understand. And the only thing I could think to say at the time was like, well, I just haven't met the right guy. And now I'm like, the thing I should have said was I'm looking for a man to carry my water. <laughs> see how that would go down. <laughs> so I'm, like, would have loved it. I'm ready with the joke. Uh, I'm, I'm ready to, you know, would have loved humorously it. start a larger gender parity conversation when we go back. Um, well, that's that's one interesting thing, you know. On the water committees that we set up, we always make sure there's equal number of women and men, mm. and the women are the ones that actually fix the wells. Mm -hmm. The women are the ones that collect the money from everyone who's using it, and often this might be 50 cents a day. It's not a lot of money, but the repairs are carried out by the women mm. because they're so much more invested. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're always, you know, culturally we have to kind of appoint the token guy, right? you know, who's like the, um, we always make the women the treasurers. The women yeah. are always in charge of the money. Yeah. Um, You're a smart man. But, so that's really, you know, that's just been cool to see as well, you know, how the women can actually, um, once they have clean water, how well they're able to steward that. Mm -hmm. And that, that becomes a really precious resource for them. Mm. So I think it's probably pretty clear to everybody in the room that Charity Water is a different kind of charity. And you said, when well, I mean, you say in the book, that, that you wanted to reinvent mm -hmm. charity and pass this kind of personal impact as we talk about finances and who oversees mm -hmm. what and women are treasurers there and, and you're obviously running a very different financial model here at home. How did you come up with the idea to, to reinvent a wheel of a very old system. I love talking about this. I know, it's really fun. I love the data stuff. <laughs> so, okay, so I come back from Africa, and I've got my problem or my mission. And I'm a big fan of the understanding or know, it, whatever you're doing, knowing the difference between your vision and your mission. So I didn't know any of this then, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to bring clean drinking water to everybody on the planet, thereby making people healthier, and later I learned wealthier. So, okay, so that was the mission. So I come back and I've got 50,000 photos and the only people I know are hanging out in nightclubs. <laughs> so I'm taking my laptop into DJ booths and, you know, these poor DJs have to watch me like clicking through my MacBook Pro of, you know, people drinking dirty water. So I got thrown out of some DJ booths for sure. Like, hey dude, you're killing my buzz. I will write a check, but please, not now. Yeah. Um, but but I, I learned that, um, so I had the advantage of being uniquely unqualified on paper to do this. Mm. Like, I, if I just paint that picture in time, I come back from Mercy Ships, I find out I'm $30,000 in debt because my club partner never dissolved our escort. Mm. 
So I go on a payment plan with the IRS immediately. He had no interest in contributing. I have nowhere to live, so he lets me live on his walk-in closet floor. Um, I have no job, except I'm going to do this charity thing, which is kind of more cute than anything else. And the apartment that I was living in in Soho was kind of like a drug den, because I came back and found him just completely strung out. So I'd be trying to build the charity on the laptops in the living room, and he'd come back with six friends, and we'd all flee to the Starbucks. Mm. So this was, you know, this is not optimal conditions for starting like a world-changing charity. But I was so passionate about, like I could see the end when I started, and mm. I still can. So I can see the day on earth when everybody has clean water. Um, I, it, it is so clear to me. Um, so in a way, I'm kind of working, you know, I was working backwards. Mm. Um, and as I started to talk to just every, I had the advantage of talking to everyday people about this. And I learned there was a huge cynicism and skepticism when it came to charities. Mm -hmm. And all my friends are like, man, I don't give to charity named A, you know, or I don't give to those big charities. I don't know where the money goes. You know, they take my money. It all goes to overhead. So little, you don't know your impact. You never see where it goes. So I would just hear all of these excuses and all of these objections. And I learned that this actually wasn't just anecdotal, there was data behind this. USA Today had polled Americans and found 42% of Americans said they distrusted charities. Mm -hmm. NYU Stern did an even scarier study. They polled Americans and found 70% of the people said they believed charities either wasted money or badly wasted money. So 30% of the people thought charities actually did the right thing with money. That's, a, that's the job of charities, is to raise money and do the right thing with it. So I saw this as a huge opportunity. You know, I wasn't interested in poaching donors from other charities. I was interested in reaching out to the 42% of the 70% and giving them a completely new, reimagined way, environment, by which they could give. Because I actually believed that they were depriving themselves by not giving. Their cynicism mm. was hurting themselves. And because it's a, it's a joy to give, it's a blessing. Like they wanted to help, but mm. they didn't trust the system. But that's also about changing language and a paradigm because mm -hmm. to your point, so many people have felt for so long like they're required to give. Yeah, that there's you, a lot you there, do, yeah. You do good on your day off as a penance for mm -hmm. the life that you live. And, and to really begin to encourage people that giving and service and activism is actually the thing that enriches your life mm -hmm. the most, that it is a privilege, that it is, uh, that it is an, a really sort of active form of personal superhero action. Yeah. That's, that's not something that I think a lot of people before 10 years ago understood was possible. Yeah, and, and I was living proof of that. Mm. So giving had changed my life. I mean, I came back unrecognizable. Mm. I was not partying with my friends. I was not smoking three packs a day. I was trying to convince them to care about clean water. Um, you know, I think this, there's so much there on the shame and guilt. There's so much leftover with charity. You know, even like this week, so we're 12 years in, and I was online, and it was a huge charity that you all would know. And it's just the poverty porn that they're serving up on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Like the kids with flies on their face, with the sad eyes looking at the camera. And this is a vestige from, you know, the, you remember those Sally Struthers commercials from mm -hmm. the 80s and 90s. And, it, you know, it, it, it works. It actually works. Shame and guilt does move giving. And in fact, I've been told by these organizations that if you test charity water ads against theirs, Theirs will outperform ours, right? If, if we had an ad, back. ours would be, well, so here's the thing. Because that's what's interesting. But when you mobilize people with positivity, you create Or do you tell anyone? Repeat. There's zero word of mouth, right? So uh. if you see a Sally Struthers commercial, even if it gets you to give, are you like, yo, I saw this amazing, inspiring organization no. like, helping like the kids with the flies on their face? You don't. Right. Right? And, and you would never wear the t-shirt of that organization that makes you feel shameful or guilty. So I think the best parallel um, was Nike. So Nike, so if Nike was a traditional charity, they would say, America, you are so fat and lazy and ugly. Why don't you turn off your TVs, put away the Doritos and go for a run, go exercise. <laughs> like, no, it wouldn't work. 
I would you want to wear, you wanna wear that shirt? <laughs> no. You want to wear the shirt? You want to buy their shoes? No. no. If they spoke to you like that. And that's not what they've done. Like he said, for years, there's greatness within you. Mm. Right? You can run farther and faster than you ever thought possible. Right? They tell stories, uh, you know, story after story of people overcoming impossible odds, overcoming adversity. You don't have legs? Nike believes you can run a marathon. Right? You lost your arm? Nike believes you can compete at basketball. Like there's this, so people want to wear the simple. They want to buy the gear. They want to tell their friends about a brand. So for us, you know, that was about hope and opportunity and inspiration. We were going to be inviting people to a party. Hmm. So I, I was actually still going to be throwing parties. The parties would just look different. These were parties of radical generosity, parties of compassion where people actually, um, rejected the apathy that would be so easy to embrace with a paralyzing global issue mm. and said, I could do something. I could donate a birthday. I could donate $10. I could, uh, and I, I do this because I want to. You know, mm. I believe the more you give, the more you give. Mm -hmm. Like it's this virtuous cycle. You can get addicted to giving of your time and your talent and your money. So I had all these ideas that maybe weren't articulated then, but just it had to feel like Nike or Apple and not like kids with flies on yeah. their face, not shame and guilt. And then the 100% model was just this response to taking the most common objection we heard, which is, I don't know where my money's going. I'm like, okay, what if we told you 100% of your money's going? Would that be good enough? Would 100% be good enough? Like, would that be the yeah. drop the mic? And, and you know, there's, a, there's an amazing guy called Dan Pallotta, who I know, who has been fighting the you know, overhead battle now for 15 years, trying to convince Americans that overhead is good. And I actually theoretically agree with him. Um, we have overhead just like other charities, but it's an uphill battle. So yeah. I was like, you know what? The only way to reach out to the 42 or the 70% is to tell them that every single penny, dollar, million dollars would go directly to help people. And then I said in, in bank account number two, I hope I can find very visionary, generous people to get excited about the overhead. Right. Who will pay for the toner of our Epson copy machine. Right. Right. It's not that you don't hours. have the overhead. It's that you figured out how to do two kinds Separate of sponsorship. It. it would just be clear. It would be black and white. Yeah. And then we realized <coughs> that we could prove where the money went if we weren't stepping on it. Mm. So money wouldn't be fungible. You know, it wouldn't be going to this big pot where we pay ourselves first <coughs> and then send what's left to the field. Mm. And it's tricky because you do need to get paid and you should get paid and so should your staff. It's, it's the same argument we make Not about... too much though, Sophia. You well, we can't get paid too much. But it's the same argument we make about teachers. It's like, why aren't teachers... People like us poor. Hello. Oh, that's not going to change. It drives me crazy. I, I, I tell best, people... You want the best minds and you want people America's to, not to ready be able for that to yet. live well. I, I, know, know, but, I know, but I do believe that what you're doing is helping to bridge that gap. I think because so, but I still believe this, guys. I can drive a $60,000 Toyota or Volvo and not a $20,000 Mercedes. Hmm. Perception is reality. It's, it's all like, and, and we actually drive a Kia Sorento, if anybody cares. <laughs> You're like, two, let me just clarify. Two quick. car seats in the back, like a right. bunch of smushed raisins. Uh, <laughs> But it's, it's actually, it, it is, um, it's a challenge, right? We celebrate like mm -hmm. the oil executives getting $50 million, you know, payouts. when they, I don't celebrate that. Well, I think that's a crime. The, the, the society kind of celebrates the, sure. the American dream of, you know, make millions as long as you're not running the Red Cross. <laughs> as long as. Yeah. So I, I, I'm actually, I, I'm, I've just embraced that and just, sure. you know, in, in, in winning trust. Like, I'll give you an example. So we've raised $330 million now. We've never bought a business class ticket for myself. One year I did 98 flights. Like, I'm 6'1", guys. I don't like flying coach, okay? But, you know, to be able to say to donors, yeah. we take stewardship of your money. This is the overhead donors. This isn't even the public, right? right. There are 131 families that pay for all of our overhead, 80 staff, and an office in New York, all my flights. Mm -hmm. But still, it's just a value of stewardship. Yeah, I get it. Um, I'll tell you a story. There was one night where um, I was speaking in Peoria, Illinois. And then that night, I had to be in, it was the afternoon in Peoria. That night in San Francisco, flight out of Peoria gets canceled. So I rent a car, race to Chicago O'Hare. The only two seats to get me to my speaking gig on time are in first class on Virgin. So I buy them personally so that I could still say this. <laughs> 
Yeah. Because like it's worth it. See, I'm it was very, worth eighteen hundred bucks. Yeah. Personally, that, to, but to be able to say like we actually like black yeah. and white. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but we pay back the credit card fees on all donations. So if any of you guys went on our website with your Amex and gave a hundred bucks right now, sadly we get ninety-seven dollars. And you don't really think of that. You're like, I made $100, I got a tax receipt for $100. bucks. charity water gets $97. Yeah. We actually pay back the $3 from our 130 families and we send your $100 to the field. Because I'm just like black awesome. and white. Two bank accounts audited separately. You know, these are the things that win trust over a period of time yeah. and that I think can really differentiate. I, I, by the way, I don't preach the 100% model to all young social entrepreneurs. It was right for us, as you'll read in the book, it almost wasn't right. I mean, there were moments of insolvency, moments on the brink. Um, it's incredibly difficult running two separate bank accounts and trying to run them in perfect balance. But it was right for us. What I think is people just want to know where their money is going. That's what I was going to ask. Clarity. Is like, when an organization doesn't have 130 families who fund ops, which are expensive. Just tell people where the money's going. Exactly. It's got to be about be transparency. Because I think that's what... That's the best. That's the value. So the hyper transparency is the yeah, value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like I like to be hyper transparent. I was on a flight. I was on a Southwest flight in the middle seat last week, and somebody was like, "What are you doing, flying coach? Aren't you on TV?" And I was like, "I bought this ticket. That's what I'm doing, <laughs> flying coach in the middle seat." Um, and it makes people laugh. And the and the and the irony is whether you're talking about you know your personal reality or or a business, just yes. being honest, yep. I think, helps. Yep. And and if you can explain to people via transparency, this is the, you know the advice for social entrepreneurs. If you want to run a great campaign, you need a graphic design plan. You need a website. Those things cost money, but yep. your donors need to know how much operating your organization costs, mm -hmm. and then how much you're putting to use um, in the field, and and how you're doing that very effectively. And yep. and I. I, I, I like that you're very honest about the fact that Charity Water is lucky to have those things yeah. be separate, but if you're not, it's transparency, transparency, transparency. And people are open to a lot of value propositions. If I told right. you guys right now that like the front door of our office was broken and we were going to get broken into and it was 450 bucks to fix it, like people would pay for the office door. Right. Like People actually want to meet needs. They want to meet tangible needs. But they need to know what they are. They need to know what they are, and they actually... You know, the problem is, you know, we hear about a charity that raises billions of dollars during a disaster and then 10 years later hasn't spent the money. Right. But in the fine print said, we can actually use this money for anything we want. And, that's and you're what, like, but that's I was what, donating to that disaster. Right. There was, yeah. there was a story many years ago, I think it was the tsunami, <laughs> um, and Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, um, had over-raised, like, by a lot, by, I think, like, hundreds of millions. Wow. And they sent everybody their money back. And what do you think 99% of people said back to them? Keep my money. Mm -hmm. They tried to return the money to people saying, we just can't use it for the disaster you intended. And because they did that, people were like, we trust you. Use it for whatever, yeah, wherever it for whatever it's most you needed. Need. So that's just, but that's the fundamental value that like, you know, people value opacity hmm. sometimes. Like, let us make all the decisions. Well, so and do that's you, not the future. But do you think that that, when you look at the fact that Charity Water has over a million donors and fundraisers and sponsors, and, and you know, this is where all the numbers come in that I get excited about. In 12 years, you've brought clean water to 8.5 million people. You've visited so many of these communities. There's, there's, a, there's something that you've harnessed that makes people feel like they're in it with you. Like they're really invested with you, whether they're as lucky as I am and they've gotten to go to Ethiopia with you or whether they're watching the videos. And so transparency and honesty and, and an open dialogue with your community does some of it. Storytelling and helps. That was my next question. Yeah. What else do you think it is and do you think it's the stories of the community that you guys then share yeah. with the community at large. If I had to keep one, if I had to go back 12 years mm. and keep one thing, I would lose the 100% model. I would lose design and branding. Mm. I would, um, I could lose photos and GPS and all that stuff. I would keep storytelling. Mm. If I could only pick one thing that we're good at, it would be storytelling. 
What's the first story that comes to mind when you talk about that? Well, I tell a lot of them in the book. Um, so I'll, I'll tell one that's not, that I actually didn't talk about in the book. Because it's a story I never got to tell. Okay. Um, but I think it speaks to the way that we um, maybe counterintuitively would tell stories. So we crowdfunded a drilling rig six years ago. And we got 10,000 people. I think you helped as well with that. We got 10,000 people to give about 100 bucks each to put a brand new million dollar drilling rig into effect in Ethiopia. I think it was our sixth then. And we put everybody's names on the rig. And we thought we were very clever because we mounted a GPS tracker to the rig. And we built a website for it so you could see where the rig was at any moment. And then we gave the, the rig a Twitter account. And then we we're like, our rig tweets. <laughs> Six years ago, right? So we, t we trained our Ethiopian drillers to press a button whenever they started drilling, and it would tweet, like, here I am, look at me on a satellite map. So that was all great, and people loved it. We sent um, video back of the first well being drilled to the 10,000 people, and then it just, it just did its thing. It drilled um, about 90 wells, actually, every single year, year after year. Mm. So I find out, five years later, through the grapevine in the office, through our programs team, that our rig crashed. Our Ethiopian partners like, ran it off the road, and the rig is on its back. The wheels are up in the air, right, like a bug, kind of. And, and these things are huge. I mean, they look like they're huge. Tonka trucks, yeah, this but is a, like super sized. This is a giant, giant yeah. vehicle. Um, so you know, the part. This is kind of like when you crash your parents' car. You <laughs> fix the car first, and then you tell your parents. I crashed the car, but I fixed it, and everything's fine. Right. So our partners were doing that. They were you know, going to repair it. It was going to probably take them a month. They were going to put it back into action. And then they were going to tell us, hey, you know, the, the rig, it, it had an accident, but we, we fixed it. So the minute I get wind of this, I'm, I'm like, get a camera crew there right now. Get me photos and video of our rig crashed. And I'm going to email the 10,000 people and say, we, we crashed your rig. I'm so excited to tell the story. Oh, it's like the best story I've been able to tell in 10 years. So I'm going to deliver the bad news because, because the stories we tell always speak to a, a larger value that I'm trying to convey. And the value that I would have con conveyed there in that story was our partners are not drilling wells by the highways. Okay? They're going to the ends of the earth. Right. They are trying to reach the most marginalized villages, mm -hmm. sometimes over dubious roads that they should not be on. Roads, and they we say took, lightly. Yeah, they took yeah. a risk. They took a gamble. It didn't pay off. Mm. They're going to fix it. But I want you to know this is the work you're funding. This is the spirit of the work that you're funding. Mm. And it would have resonated. By the time I got them there, they'd already fixed the rig and it was off drilling again. Got it. But that's, that's a story <laughs> most people would be afraid. They, they would almost want to hide that. Mm. I want to celebrate that. Mm. And, and not, like, not in celebrating a failure because it's not, you know, we don't want to crash rigs. And it was a month of not drilling. But I just know that people would have appreciated the reality. Because, again, it speaks to the transparency. And we get in accidents. Like, we, yeah. we just, and, and, and the important thing is, like, what were you trying to do? And did you respond? Did you fix it? Right. Oh, so I, I never got that. to tell that story. There's another okay. just short story that I never got to tell in the book um, where there was a woman. <laughs> so, okay, so you go to some of these villages, and it's a horrible irony to realize that the water that can save the lives of the people there and of their children is 20 stories underground. So it's like, imagine getting in an elevator and press like negative 20. And there's a, there's a lake, a massive lake or an aquifer. And you know, it takes anywhere between two to three days to drill a well if, if you find water. So there was this one, um, I heard the story that our partners were drilling a well in a village and as um, Sophia said, like, it's a celebration. A thousand people come out. They, you know, there's a huge <coughs> ring around the rig. They're watching, they're anticipating, they're clapping, they're, you know, bringing the well drillers um, amazing Ethiopian coffee or injera mm. or whatever. And they're waiting for this moment to see, are they going to be successful? So they are in this village and water shoots out of the ground. They flush the well and everybody's laughing and clapping. And there's a woman off to the side. I did that again. There's a woman off to the mm. side who's weeping. And our partners go up to her and they're like, hey, why are you crying? Um, duh, this is a happy day for the village. And, you know, why, why, why are you sad? Seriously. And, you know, she's, she's like filled with rage. And she says, do you mean to tell me that my entire life mm -hmm. I have been walking? 
I've been watching people die. It was underneath my feet this whole time. Mm. And, you know, you're like, I, I get it. I mean, I get it. And, you know, I, it, they, they didn't have anything to say <laughs> to her. You know, yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't tell her to go and join the celebration. You, you understand that pain. It just seems so simple to her. Like, a truck came in, and now this thing, mm. you know, that, that has been killing us is, is now done. It was that easy? Like, how come no one else did that? Mm -hmm. How come someone didn't do that 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago? Right. So I think these stories get people, you know, if it's about someone, you know, who is feeling beautiful. I mean, there was a, there was a woman I was with in Niger who lost eight children. And, you know, it was such a study in grief or resiliency. And she names all eight children through a translator, she starts telling me the ages at which they had all died, you know, many of them under five. And there was, um, she was standing next to this terrible well, um, and she said she'd actually fallen into the well with one of her two remaining children, and she fell to the bottom of the well. This is almost 100 feet. She managed to keep her child out of the water and save her child's life. She went into a coma for a week. They brought her up. And, you know, she's, you know, her, her back was kind of injured, but she was okay. And she had to go back to the same well to get water. And she says to me, you know, you have to face your fear. Mm. So she's going to the same, now, um, my son was being born at that time, and we actually ran a birth campaign for him. And we just said, look, I don't need Shel Silverstein's giving tree or seven copies of, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, we were just getting all this stuff almost in, in multiple, it felt, having our first kid. And we said, look, um, my son's going to be born into a world where everyone has clean water. So let's do a birth campaign. And we specifically made sure that his money went to her village. And she now has clean water, and I got to see it. Um, but that, you know, those kind of, those transformations, in the same way that Mercy Ships, I mean, you guys will see some of the photos of the surgeries. You know, it's before and after. And I love that. Like, I, I am not great with complexity. <laughs> Maybe as you can tell, you know? I really want the dramatic, um, we made a difference. You know, you look at a picture like this, and you know that you improved this guy's life. Okay? Like, there is, it is an inarguable good. It's the same thing with water. Mm -hmm. When you bring clean water into a community, you just know, this is not dead aid. This is not wasted. Like, mm -hmm. you have universally... Um, helped the, the child, the woman, the family, the community mm. improve their lives in a really meaningful way. And that's the beauty, we were talking about this too, of being charity water in like perhaps the most toxic, caustic, you know, political, angsty time that certainly I've ever lived in where mm -hmm. everybody seems to hate each other, everybody's fighting, the right and the left, and you know, people are fighting about religion, they're fighting about politics, and yet... I never come off a stage and have anyone tell me to stop it. Right. It doesn't matter where I am. No one's like, oh, they should be dying of bad water. Right? Let the women walk. Yeah. Right? So no one, and it's beautiful. Like, we have some of the most conservative people supporting, some of the most liberal people supporting. We have school kids. He wisely in points at me. Hello? You know, some of, the, some of the, you know, school kids during Ramadan in Dubai send in yeah. $6,000. And mega churches raise money. And synagogues raise money. And our biggest donor mm -hmm. who's given over $15 million is an atheist. He thinks I pray to a figment of my imagination. You know? Right. But he can stand for clean water. But that, I think, is so special when you give people such a clear yes. Such a clear sign of what's right that we don't have to argue mm -hmm. anymore. And that is, I think, now especially what people need more than ever. And yeah. I think about the stories and I think about the donated birthdays and I think about the campaigns and, and I think that it's really powerful and I'm just like, I'm so proud of you, man. It's really powerful to be a beacon of hope in a world where virtually all of us, I would imagine at least once a day go, well, what am I supposed to do about it? Mm. Like, really, what do, I, what do I get to do about it? Mm -hmm. And we try, but in times like these, it can feel futile. We don't give up. We don't do that. 
But for someone to know that if they contribute mm -hmm. to Charity Water, they're bettering someone's life, period, end yeah. of story. That's a big fact to hold on to and, and to understand. And I know that, you know, her story is in the book, but when you think about Rachel's yeah. story. The children often lead us. You know, a little girl who wanted to raise 300 bucks for her birthday wound up because of a tragedy raising well over a million dollars. And you guys will read the story in the book. And it, it's small donations. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about the places where kids' lives are bettered and it's mm -hmm. water and education. And I was just telling Scott backstage that I managed to get people to wrap their heads around how to raise tens of thousands of dollars to build a school because I challenged high school kids. I said, if both of your parents go get a coffee every day, let's call it five bucks a day on coffee. And if you wake up 30 minutes early and you make a, cup, you make a pot of coffee for your parents for five days, ask them if at the end of the week they'll give you $25. Mm -hmm. And they did it. Mm -hmm. And I had parents coming up to me being like, what magic are you sprinkling? My child is talking to me in the mm -hmm. morning. <laughs> and, and suddenly you realize there are these little ways to remind people of how powerful they are. Yeah. Because we build wells with $10 donations yeah. and schools with $20 donations. And, and actually, as, as, a, as an engaged motivated populace were incredibly powerful but there are very few people who remind us of that mm. and you guys because you were a little bit of a radical who didn't know what you were doing but you we came were... in and you told a story that reminded yeah. us of exactly that but i think it's important we remind people of that by telling other stories not our own right so we really look at our role for 12 years as the guide in the hero's journey so this is we are not I... the hero but this is good advice to any budding so many entrepreneur businesses in the audience. Are like, we're awesome, making this cool product, mm. crushing everybody else, right? Or the charity's like, we're amazing, we're out there saving lives. We have never done that. We have always said our community is amazing, our local partners. We have deflected the credit for 12 years. Mm. So, you know, Ethiopia is a great example. We've invested 70 or 80 million in the country. We employ 250 locals every day. But when we go in, they are celebrated. Mm -hmm. I go into villages, they don't even know who I am. They don't know who Charity Water is. We're not putting our name on the wells. They know who our local partner is. They, they celebrate the 250 um, people at rest who many of you've met, the drillers there. Yeah. You know, our, our well drillers in Ethiopia, they're doing 29 out of 30 days a month. They take one day off because the dry season is only eight months. So they right. see their families for four months and they're taking one day off because they want to maximize that time and save as many lives of their own people as possible. Mm. So we're telling their stories. You know, we're telling the story of Rachel. We're telling the story of um, just this, this year for World Water Day. Um, we got lucky with the story. We opened up the mail one day and a little girl who was six had sent in $8.15 and she drew a picture of herself next to what she thought a well looked like with clean water. And she wrote, Dear Charity Water, I'm sending in $8.15 so people don't die in Africa. Mm. So actually, so, so kids don't die. And, you know, being Charity Water, we had a camera crew at her house three days later. Um, and we just immediately got the idea for the campaign. Let's ask everyone to join Nora in giving $8.15. We scrapped all of our plans. Yeah. We shot this beautiful three-minute video of her just letting us in on her thought process. She saw the video of people drinking dirty water. She saw the need. She went up to her room and she said, should I give or should I not give? Should I keep my money? Should I give my money? She said, I thought about this for a while. And then she came down the next morning and she dropped $8.15 on the counter in front of her mom and I said, this is, I'm gonna give my allowance. And then she wrote the note and sent it in. Yeah. So we just launched this campaign. We, we made the video. I think we raised $82,000 in a day wow. as other people gave $8.15. And because of her eight, her little seed turned into eight villages now with clean water. So I think those are the stories we tell. It's not, you know, I mean, I'll tell my personal story for five minutes, you know, just to establish who I am and where I came from. But I love telling all the other stories. Mm -hmm. I love telling the other people's stories, the community's stories, and hope that they inspire everyday people to get involved. Mm. 
So past taking the ego out of the storytelling and owning being a vessel, really. The guide, yeah. What do you, if there's somebody out here who's trying to figure out how to start their charity, oh, I'm getting the signs. It's going to be my last question, I promise. Um, <laughs> if there's somebody out here who wants to start their project, yeah. what's, what's the big piece of advice? I think you have to really immerse yourself in the problem. First, so I was lucky in that I didn't drive by, you know, I didn't do a two-week mission trip to an mm. orphanage, or um, I mean, I lived it. So I lived in Liberia for a full year, and so I think that's the first. If if someone is really going to do it, I think they need to put in the time to become an authority, right? Mm. There was I did have a different level of authority when I came back from Mercy Ships because I'd spent two years, not two weeks. Right. Right. I know so many people that are like, oh, I went to Africa um, and I'm going to start a charity. I'm like, how long were you there? Like um, nine days. <laughs> like three of it was safari, but you know, I got right. to... <laughs> So, you know, I would say, great, go back for like nine months and right. see if you still want to do it. Um, it takes a lot. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan. If, if a social entrepreneur wants to dedicate their life to a cause, first, I think they have to really own it and live it um, to have the authority and the... Um, you know, almost the, um, people want to know that you've been there and mm. not just talking, like, you, these are my stories, mm -hmm. right? Like, I, I know Nora, you know, I, I've, the story, um, you know, the little girl who hung herself, you know, I, I lived in the village for a week, you know, I took mm. Rachel's mom to, um, on the one year anniversary, like, I've lived all of these stories, so... I think that's really important. Someone that starts something, they have to start creating their own stories mm. and, and then really count the cost. It's incredibly hard. It's extraordinarily hard. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book is because I think from the outside, it looks like we're crushing it. Mm. You know, we raise all this money and, you know, there's, we have 2 million Twitter followers or whatever. And it, it, it feels like it's really easy. It's really hard. Yeah. Really, 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 really hard. Like, it's infinitely harder than I could have ever imagined. And, uh, you know, the, the question I get a lot these days is like, wow, you know, you guys have raised a third of a billion dollars. Like, did you ever think you'd be so successful? And the real answer is, I thought we would be infinitely more successful. Mm -hmm. We have been so fractionally, like, this has been one-fiftieth of what I imagined we would have done by now. Right. It should be billions. Because everyone should just get it's it. Freaking clean water. It's a hundred percent. Like what? I, I don't know. Like yeah. I feel literally inept that yeah. I have been unable to move trillions of dollars helping no one mm -hmm. that are just sitting in bank accounts and donor advised funds. Right. You know, we've moved a million people in twelve years to care. How many people live in this country? Yeah. Three hundred fifty million. So, the good news is, I think you know the best is yet to come. And in some ways, it really feels like it's the beginning of the journey. Yeah. So instead of the, you know, the, the burnout phase, I'm like, okay, well, let's take everything we've learned over the last 12 years and let's, let's try and scale. You know, mm -hmm. We're actually really getting good at, at all of it now. So hopefully we can go from a million people to two million supporters and five million and ten million. Right. That's but good. this is not what I imagined. Yeah. I thought we would have done much more. I got a really good piece of advice because obviously in different ways we both – dedicate our lives to trying to make the world a better place. And I, I often sort of have this conundrum where I go, I don't understand how you could give people all the thing, all the facts, all the things. It should be so easy to get people to care and, and change and mobilize for their community and their neighbors and, and whatever. And a, a mutual friend of ours said to me, yeah, but you picked the long game and longevity isn't sexy. And we live in a universe of Twitter and Instagram where there's turnover. Every second you scroll, 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 scroll on your phone, there's a new yeah. thing. And, and all of us in our small community yeah. picked a really long game. And, and when, you, when you have to sort of realize that a million in 12 years doesn't feel big enough because you know how big it should be if everybody cared in the same way. Yeah you also realize it's a marathon, and it's yep. like, okay, so this is only mile one. So actually, we're killing it. And I think we would recommend the long game. Because yeah. we see so many people quit after four years or six years, and 
Like you, you're missing out on that potential tipping point or the inflection point. Mm -hmm. Just now, I mean, there are, just by nature of showing up for 12 years, there are people that have been watching mm -hmm. that are now starting to give. Right. There was someone that read the book two weeks ago and just gave $300,000. Wow. But they've been watching for a long time. Yeah. It was just like, oh, you're still here. Can I also, just for one second... <laughs> like, you haven't gone away. I yeah. guess we should finally give you some money now. You're like, hello, I'm never <laughs> leaving. Uh, 12 years and a, and a million donors and eight and a half million people and all the things. But, like, to, to shrink it, because you have a very global view of the world, you wrote a book. Yeah. Like, there's, like, a physical yeah. book I think it's that good. we can touch. And you I, wrote it. It's very good. I tried. And I just want to, like, I want to bring the room in to celebrate this because you always, to your point, you tell everybody else's story, but like this is a really big moment in your story. Um, I'm really excited and Thanks proud so. of you and like always impressed for Of course, I had to go give all the money away. Whatever. Everybody's like, what it's are you, an good. idiot? You know what? Kids college fund. Like Book two can be the kids college fund. I think they'll both yeah. be great. Yeah, best, best decision I, I ever made. I'm so, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm very proud to be up here with you. I'm flattered that I was asked to do that. I'm glad you all came. Um, and I know that we've yammered for like far too long. I just have all the questions for him, but we'll open it up to the audience because I imagine a lot awesome. of you guys have questions too. I think there's a mic, right? Or you can probably shout thank it. You, thank you, Sophia. Um, questions around here and Life Talks LA typically start, I like to say, with a W or an H and sometimes a D. They are generally short. There is no such thing as a two-part question. And tonight, <laughs> only Sophia gets to ask. Oh my gosh! Can I take questions. you on the road? <laughs> uh, I'll uh, ask amazing. the first question. If anyone has a question, raise your hand, and I'll come to you. I'm curious. I'm an immigrant to this country, and as are many others from lots of the countries you serve. Yeah. Is there any active effort to sort of organize around, uh, you know, immigrant Americans or who to to to? to support efforts in their respective countries? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that has surprised me is how uh, little traction we've seen when we've tried to do that. With, with um, you name the diaspora, um, it, it's been very difficult. And I'm not sure why that is, you know, if it's, um, I mean, we've had, we've had people, I, I, I almost don't want to name any countries, but we've had people in different countries kind of say, look, I'm trying to get all my friends to, you know, all my rich doctor, lawyer friends to give back to this country. And they'll say, wow, it didn't really work. Um, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll set them up to host the party or host the event. So, I, boy, if you have any thoughts of how we could be better at that, I mean, it seems like a natural fit. Um, mm to, you know, to, to take, like, if you've, if you've left or emigrated and, and really made some success, you know, can you help people be more successful? So we, we have not cracked that code yet. Um, I, I'd say um, we have seen a lot of traction with adopted parents from countries. Mm. So that's, that's all, you know, if, if you are maybe a wealthy couple or a middle-class couple, whatever, um, when you adopt a child from one of these countries, there's a real desire, I think, to want to, um, connect back with that country. So we've seen a lot of people that'll call up and say, adopted a child from Ethiopia or Malawi or you know wherever it is, and can we do a water project you know in our child's honor, which is mm. which is cool. Uh, thank you, Scott, for what you've done and the inspiration that you brought to social entrepreneurship. Uh, my question is, when you're starting something, um, you can get really discouraged, face obstacles that uh, seem insurmountable at times. Can you talk about a time when uh, you wanted to give up? and what you did to overcome it? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I write about this in the book. So, you know, the 100% model just, it, it was almost untenable at the beginning because it was just an idea. And, you know, now it's much easier to get someone to pay for employee number 83 <laughs> when people have already paid for, you know, 82 employees, let's just say. So there was this moment at the beginning where I don't know. I think I just always had a lot of faith that this was meant to be. Like, this is what I was supposed to be doing. There was enough confirmation along the way. Um, so I have, you know, I have a pretty deep faith, and I pray a lot, and I expect miracles. And I've seen enough over, um, over the years where at that moment, you know, that I thought, 
um, the game was up, something came through. So, you know, the, the darkest moment was this moment I write about in the book where we ran out of money and overhead. And we had nine employees and we'd been skipping our salaries and I had tapped every person that I knew could possibly be interested in giving to overhead. Um, my board was letting me down at the time and we had a couple weeks of funding left. We were gonna miss our office rent. Like it was over, but the frustrating thing is we had $881,000 in a bank account we couldn't touch. So in a way we were a victim of our own success. They, the 100% model was working. People were giving. I was hearing, this is the first charitable donation I made in my entire life. So in a way, like it was, we were, we were so encouraged by the idea. The idea was right, but yet we hadn't figured out the, the other. And I, I'll never forget, I mean, I was praying for a miracle. I was praying for like an angel, you know, to figure this thing out. And um, I was unwilling to borrow from the 800 grand though. And that was the common advice I was getting. People said, well, wait a minute, you, you're going broke? You have $800,000, that's nine months of payroll and office. Like, just go take that money and write an IOU and you can pay it back later. Like money is fungible. And I was like, if we take one penny, if we even borrowed a penny from that bank account, we would compromise our integrity. You know, there'd be a crack at the core and we might as well all resign in shame. Like why would we even bother? So I was gonna, you know, I was gonna basically unwind the organization, send out all $881,000 and just say, hey, this didn't work. And uh, at that moment, you know, a complete stranger um, walked in the office, sat with me, had a two-hour meeting. You've met him. And uh, I remember thinking, like, this guy doesn't even like me. Um, <laughs> he was very British, so just didn't, didn't give me much. You know, it was just, uh, he was cynical and said, look, I don't give charities. I don't trust charities. And I remember being very um, transparent and saying, look, 100% model's working. I mean, there was a drug dealer once that gave 500 bucks said he had never given to a charity before. It was like selling marijuana, but he's like, you deserve $500 because I know it's going to get people. So um, I might have told this donor that story. And, and then he says, well, let me think about your problem. And two days later, he sends me an email. Um, and I remember getting it. It was after midnight. I was in bed. I had the laptop, um, very little faith. Um, and it was just really sad. And he says, um, hey, Scott, I really enjoyed meeting with you. I wired a million dollars into your overhead account. And we went from insolvent to 13 months of operating capital. And you know, it's interesting, at the t I remember um, calling up every single employee and board member from 1 to 2.30 a.m. I'm like, a million dollars. I remember logging on, to the, I didn't believe it was real, I logged on to the online bank and there was one comma zero 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 comma zero zero zero. And, uh, and I think, you know, what I learned about that, so actually, my greatest ambition around money to this day is to do the same. Mm. I actually want to write a million dollar check to someone else's charity. Mm. Now, that, that, that probably will not happen, but it's not like, it, it won't happen in the short term. It, may actually, it, w it actually will happen at some point. But it's not a nicer car. It's not a house in the Hamptons. It's not, you know, a five-star vacation. Like, I actually want to pay that back, but not in mentorship, not in the $330 million, like, to water. I want to actually do that. I want to change the game for someone else. And I think as much as the money, it was the confidence. Like he believed in me and in our idea at the time. Um, enough to then, for me to believe I could go find other people like that. And now mm. there's 131 of them. So I think, you know, go find people who can encourage you, who, you know, surround yourself with people who believe in you. And you just got to keep asking. I mean, you just have to keep asking and, um, I don't know, um, it could have ended differently, but it didn't. It was meant to be. Cool. And I've now taken him and his family, he, his wife, and his three kids to 11 countries. Wow. And he's given $18 million. Wow. So that turned into a, a really beautiful relation. Even, um, even more special, um, he started a foundation that has now raised $13 million for other causes, including prison reform and education. So, you know, it's a really beautiful story. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you so much for what you've been doing and for all the sacrifices. I come from India, so I understand, you know, what all the hardships you spoke about women. My question to you is, 
when you go to certain countries, do you also have to think about, you know, um, giving money because of the red tape issues which garments will bring yeah. about? Mm. Yeah, so we have a really, um, so we only work with local partners. I don't know if we really flesh that out. So I, we don't send any Westerners. So nobody looks like me working in India um, or Africa. Um, we, we work in five states in India, all with local um, Indian uh, NGOs. You know, one of my favorites is, is in uh, Odisha, um, run by a guy uh, who's been at it for 40 years. So we came alongside him, and then we just increased the capacity of the organization through funding. Um, so we never, we never give money to the government. So Charity Water has never actually given money to the government. It's always to the local NGO. And then we just have, we have a process. Um, we have an audit process. Internally, we have an external audit process that we use um, both programmatically and from a fiduciary standpoint. So there's a, there's a team of 19 people whose entire full-time jobs are following the money and monitoring the quality uh, around the world. But we, we've actually found amazing local partners. Like if you, it's kind of like a relationship. If you find great people that you can trust, then you, know, you, can, you can have a really um, meaningful, long-time relationship. So there's a lot of vetting, there's a lot of dating that goes on. And you know, our partner in Ethiopia, that started with a $45,000 grant, and we'll give them $11 million this year to one, um, one local partner. And we built trust, and I've been there 30 times, and they've been to see us. And so we, that hasn't been uh, a problem for us, you know, corruption or you know, uh, failed audit reports. We've, we've been really fortunate. And I think if it was, we'd be transparent. And, um, but we're, we're really on top of it. We have an amazing team that does that, best in the world. And our final question for the evening. Hi, uh, my name's Elijah, um, and I was a Ride for Water cyclist along with this group. And Oh, amazing. Um, yeah. Did I just uh, ride with you in New York? The uh, no, I was on the 2017 team, but okay, cool. we're super proud of 2018 and everything they've accomplished. Um, but I just, uh, I currently work for World Vision International, and um, just honestly an honor to see you again, and I'm really yeah. thankful for the time that you gave us in New York. Um, yeah, my, my question is, sorry, I, uh, I'm going to boil it down to this. I've been thinking the whole time and I think, um, this hunger that we have to do something, um, how do we, how do we make it more effective? How do we get it to actually be impactful? Um, like when you talk about how we should be at, at billions of dollars right now, like we yeah. should move that trillions out how can we move this hunger and really get our skills and our networks and our people that we know to be more impactful? That was not a short question. I apologize. I'm not good at those. but I don't know that I know the answer to that. Um, I think that's the question we ask ourselves every day. Um, I don't feel like we've cracked the code yet. I think mm. we've scratched the surface um, of generosity. I think Seth, a guy named Seth Godin said um, this fragment to me once. He said, people like us, people like us. So I think if you can make radical, I, I was in, um, I saw Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood recently, which was so beautiful. And he said something about, let's make kindness attractive. Mm. So I think like, can we make radical generosity attractive? Can we make giving attractive? Can we keep elevating these stories of people um, who are giving in a radical way, in an unselfish way, giving of their money, giving of their time, where you know, our heart leaps and say, I wanna be like that girl. You know, that's why Rachel inspired 31,000 people. It, it wasn't her death. Lots of people die, you know, with, with fundraising. I mean, there's, there's, there was a tragedy in New York with this limo accident um, right near us. And it was the fact that her, her wish, her heart was so pure. She saw a problem that we all see every day, right? Pick one. And she said, I'm actually going to make a great sacrifice to meet this problem. So I'm going to cancel my birthday party and I'm gonna to refuse to accept gifts so that I can raise $300, mm. which is jump change to a lot of people. And I think when she didn't realize that, right, she realized 220, it, it like arrested people. It was disruptive mm -hmm. because she's better than us, right? Like she's more pure even than me. Like it, it, it challenged me and our whole, our whole organization. I mean, mm. why aren't we like Rachel? 
why aren't we, I, you know, I, the things that I care about, I could be giving up the dinner, and, and I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that we're constantly trading like, oh, a cup of coffee or a child. But there was something even deeper than, because I actually don't think that marketing works that well. I think it's like there was a deeper soulful um, desire that 31,000 people just said, we want to align with that. Uh-huh. So I don't know. I think we need to tell stories and elevate people, whether it's children, um, whether it's our local partners. We need to make heroes out of the people who mm. are doing it instead of you know, heroes of the people who are, I don't know, making hundreds of millions of dollars running huge successful businesses, um, which we have. We, we hero worship. We just often worship the, the rich and the people with the private planes and the people who are accumulating you know, hundreds of billions in, in, um, in bank accounts. I would also piggyback that, if I may, because I get what you're saying. How, how do we really create a change? And there's no beating around the bush that we have a broken system. And whether we're looking at systems in this country that have people so polarized and upset right now, or we're looking at a system that means that Millions of people around the world are drinking dirty water when clean water is 20 stories under their feet. Things are broken. But we have to figure out what bigger societal shifts require. And is it about storytelling? Certainly. Is it about priorities? Certainly. But if you want to activate tomorrow, get people your age to vote. Because 73% of the elderly in this country vote and 26% of millennials vote. And I don't know a college kid who would ever allow their grandparents to pick out their clothes, decide who they could date, select their music, or send them on their next spring break. But we are complaining about an archaic system that doesn't serve us, and we are not showing up to ask for or demand a new one. So that's a huge, huge issue because if we started electing people like us if we started funding real movements and social change our country could become a beacon for changing the world rather than be a place of backfire yeah. so yes donate your next birthday do another cycling trip it's all badass but there are bigger again longevity based unsexy, long game ways to show up and change a society. When you tell me that our country doesn't have enough money for healthcare for sick kids, but we can do another $600 billion subsidy to the military, I I don't say there's not enough money, I say we have different priorities. Mm -hmm. And so I would love for people with priorities like this guy to be in charge of all of the money. I think the world would be a much better place. That's what I, that's what I wish with you. Yeah. I you just, just think you we just should made me think of, wait, I know we got to go. You just made me think of something, yeah. you know, people um, often think that Americans are very generous and so much of our money actually goes overseas. Mm. Um, you know, the Invisible Children guys did such a good job with this. So um, less than 4% of American giving actually helps neighbors. 96% of all American philanthropy stays here yeah. in the country. So, you know, I think that extra 1% would do wonders uh-huh. across any of these issues, whether it's water or education or, you know, and, I, and I'm not going to, I don't know where it's going to come from right now, but it's, you know, people are like, oh yeah, 20% to foreign aid or like, it's like, of the U.S. budget, it's way less than 1%. Yeah. So it's a tiny, tiny fraction. And I think, um, you know, you talk about this beacon of hope. I think we can be good neighbors. We can share our resources with with others and make really mm-hmm. meaningful change. Um, so, thanks, guys. This yes. is a good place yes, to wait. start. Oh, yes. we have we have yes. When we were younger, did you think? Oh, I want to be a <laughs> No, I wanted to be a doctor or an astronaut, <laughs> but I lost my way. <laughs> Lucky for us, we found it. <laughs>